My name is Santiago and I work for the Spanish DSO and I'm here to tell you about a bit of a story of open versus closed science with this holomorphic embedding power flow. So it's not changing there. So imagine that you have a function that you want to solve and it looks like this, but you don't know. So that's why it's dotted. So you want to use a Newton Robson solver and you see it from the left and you will end up in a local minimum, but of course you don't know. So you try again, this time from the right and you end up with the correct solution, but still you don't know. So this is pretty much what we have been having in the power system computation for a very long time. So we have these Newton Robson algorithms and often people complain about the convergence and, and whatnot about these algorithms. Around 2012, I was made aware, aware of a third option. So this holomorphic embedding load flow method, which promised to give you the correct solution from the same starting point every time. So it was like a holy grail for electric calculations. So to understand a little bit more, um, let's imagine we have the power flow equations and usually we have these exploratory methods to solve it like newton robson or gauss seidel or, or like this. But this, uh, this method, the holomorphic embedding just takes this equation and turns it into a converged that we can compute any number of terms and the more terms we compute, the more exact it will become. But in order to, to, to explain this better, I want to explain to you the history of the method. So in the early 2000s, a person from Barcelona called Antonio Trias came up with this magical idea of embedding a loading parameter and solving the power flow equations in a completely different way. So he worked for a company called AIA and they happen to have quite some commercial success with the method selling the tool to at least that I'm aware of uh, two of the major distribution companies here in Spain. Later they, they started the company in the US and they got the endorsement by the Battelle Institute and later uh, a project with NASA for state estimations. At the same year, they published this very mystical paper and patents telling really nothing about the method, but just the concept. And from there on, there was uh, a collaboration with the Santa State University. And years later, more information was made available through master thesis, but it was not enough. So, in 2015, I was uh, in need of a very good power flow method to do stochastic calculations. And I started programming or at least trying to program this holomorphic embedding thing, but it didn't work. There was nothing, nothing not the papers or the master thesis were close to being replicable. And I spent a ridiculous amount of hours with this, trying to understand it and trying to replicate it. And I believe like close to 2016, I published something that kind of worked. And I remember a call with uh, Tom and, and Robbie here present and telling them, guys, don't spend your time in this. It's, it's worthless. So more stuff happened in the meantime, probably a lot of, a lot of articles, at least none with uh, code that, that I know of. And I forget about it. But later this year, in January, I got an email from a person from the University of Girona, also in Catalonia, and, and he was sending me a complete formulation, one that was very, very correct and also cold. And together we managed to get something that today is, at least in my opinion, a very competitive implementation of the holomorphic embedding power flow. So to me, the moral of the story is that there has been a lot of uh, company and academic development here, but none of that managed to, to provide replicable evidence. And the only way we, we have having, or, or the only, let's say, um, productive way of pushing this method and science forward 
is to have these open source codes. One, one minute, Santiago. Yeah, perfect. So I'm wrapping. So today we have the method implemented in, in this software called GridCal. And as you can see here is the Iberic Peninsula, which is like 5,000 nodes and the method it's solving. And there is a lot of side effects to the method, like the sigma plot, which tells you how far are the voltages of the node of the collapse point, which is depicted in the, by the black curve. So this is it. Thank you, and to be continued. So at least okay. for the questions now. With any questions, please, I'm sure there's questions out there. I'll, I'll jump on this one. Can you tell me a little about the implementation, which languages, uh, which libraries, um, lines of code? The implementation, at least the very early ones, were very clumsy because the formulations were very clumsy. So after spending quite a lot of time, especially this year, we have an implementation with Python and, and it's using just SciPy and, and NumPy, and it's about 300 lines of code in, in Python. Are there more questions? There's one there from Fabian Neumann, I think. Uh, sure. Um, yes. um, I was wondering whether you could um, maybe briefly comment on the comput computational performance of the helm compared to the NR in the experiments that you ran. Thank you for the question, because I here have this <laughs> very nice <laughs> chart showing the convergence properties, mind the logarithmic scale. So. Here we have Newton Robson and Helm. I would say that uh, if you implement them not heavily tuning the algorithms, they perform about equal. That uh, at least at least my, my experience. So I had a question. I mean, one of the advantages of the helm is it converges in cases where the Newton Robson just doesn't. Do you have any sort of large grid examples of that? Yes, well, not here, but um, well, Helm promises so much. You know, these initial papers were like <laughs> promising uh, the, the world for us. But of course, we are past the height curve, and now I have a bit of experience. So I can tell you that if a grid is terribly conditioned, it would not work. It will work in situations where Newton Robson doesn't work. Sometimes, yes. And I can tell you that sometimes Newton Robson will also give an, a, a solution where, where Helm at least struggles, probably because of our formulation, but something to keep working on. Thank you. Yannis has a question. Yeah, so uh, I was wondering, uh, are there any reasons not to go for Helm? Should Helm be available? I didn't understand. Well, it's available through my code right now. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I know that it, it's for CritKit, it's uh, implemented, but for example, for Pipesa or for others. But uh, in case you have it available for whatever platform you're using or whatever framework, are there any reasons not to go for Helm? So are there any downsides or is it really just the holy grail? It's not the holy grail. At least I don't think it is the holy grail. It's a very nice tool to have. That's my opinion on it after a, after a five years of, of thinking about this. So it can definitely be ported to, to, to the available solvers like uh, Pipesup and the Power or, or, or the like. And it's just a matter of, of putting time into it. Okay, so um, I think if that's it, then thank you very much, Santiago.